Thanks, Priest. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, that, that was just a warning. Anybody asks really stupid fucking questions, that, you know, that's what's happening. Okay. So, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go down the line real quick here and uh, give a quick introduction of everybody. I'm Jim Christie. I'm with the uh, Defense Cyber Crime Center. And turn it over to you guys. My name is Tim Kasiba. I run a forensics lab for the FBI. I've been with the FBI 12 years and the government doing forensics for about 18 years. I'm Bob Hopper. I'm with the National White Collar Crime Center. We uh, teach state and local law enforcement pretty much everything they need to know about computer forensics. I'm Tony Sager with the National Security Agency. I'm the Chief of Vulnerability Analysis and Operations for the Defensive Mission at NSA. My name is Barry Groney. I'm a special agent with the NASA Computer Crimes Division. Uh, we primarily conduct uh, intrusion investigations and no, we are not air marshals for the space shuttle. <laughs> well, good evening. I'm the token international uh, partner here today. El Langel with the Royal Canadian Mount Police, representing the Royal Canadian Mount Police uh, Technological Crime Program. I head up the Atlantic Region Integrated Tech Crime Program. My name is uh, Tim Fowler. I'm a um, Marine Special Agent assigned to the Naval Criminal Investigative Service in uh, Washington, D.C. for the uh, work in the uh, Cyber Department. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, my name is Andrew Freed. I'm a Senior Special Agent with the Treasury Department, primarily dealing with the uh, network intrusion and other issues with the Internal Revenue Service. I'm Keith Rhodes, Chief Technologist at the GAO. We test the security of the executive branch on behalf of the legislative branch, and they haven't stopped us yet. Uh, Rich Marshall, first generation deadhead, was a legal architect in a formal life for eligible receiver 97, along with Dick Clark, helped uh, write the cybersecurity strategy for the nation and currently do legislative liaison to the agency to the Hill. My name is Kevin Manson. I'm a webaholic. Hi, Kevin. You're supposed to say hi, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I coined the term cyber cop uh, a decade and a half ago, I guess it was, and uh, I was fortunate to be able to co-keynote uh, DEF CON in two or Black Hat rather than 2001 with a very good friend, Bill Tafoya, with, uh, retired from the FBI. And the thing I left with uh, the con back then is what I'd like to leave with you all, and that is the elite, the true elite are those who defend the net. Uh, my name is Lynn Wells. I'm uh, now at National Defense University uh, doing transformation, but I had several years with the networks and information integration of people in the Office of Secretary of Defense. I'd just like to remind everybody out there that about 40 percent of the Defense Department uh, acquisition workforce is going to be retiring in the next five, ten years, and uh, if you guys aren't convicted of a felony, there are lots of good opportunities. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim Finch, and I am the Assistant Director for the FBI Cyber Division. And if there is a cyber investigation being conducted on anyone in the United States, you can blame me. I'm responsible. <laughs> okay, with that, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> on that happy note. That's a throw. Why are people in the room? Kill. Yeah. <laughs> What we're, the plan is we're just opening it up to you guys for questions at this point. So we need uh, microphones for uh, folks that are going to be asking questions. Are there microphones out there? <laughs> okay, uh, th that concludes our briefing. <laughs> Did the CIA sell cocaine? <laughs> C. <laughs> okay, so stand up and uh, yell real loud. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. The, the question is, how does uh, cyber warfare fit into U.S. offensive national security strategy? Uh, there actually was a, uh, a major study that was chartered out of the Defense Quadrennial Defense Review uh, last year, QDR 2006, that looked at developing theory of cyber power and space power. 
and with the kind of point of getting to those sorts of issues. So that is underway. It is being done. Not yet finished, but uh, watch this space, and I would expect within about a year we'll have that ready. Yeah, l let me add a little bit to that. Uh, one of the first live test fires for information warfare was eligible receiver 97, and that demonstrated to our senior military and political leadership the efficacy of information warfare. I mean, it really was a real live fire exercise. It worked and uh, has made a big difference. Uh, later this year, in September 19 through 21, I think I have the dates correct, uh, there's going to be a national uh, program called InfoWarCon. Uh, which is check the web on that. It's going to be an absolutely awesome opportunity to see some of the implications of the question that you asked. That was a very good question, by the way. I'm actually interested in uh, the GAO's uh, activities regarding uh, testing of uh, their uh, sister agencies and, and departments. Um, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> any, any, anyway, anyway, uh, I, as somebody who does uh, penetration testing for uh, my organization, uh, I'm interested in your methodologies, uh, how you're working with uh, your sister organizations, uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, what what you're doing in terms of relationship building with those agencies, so they don't see you as coming in as being, uh, you know, the outsider uh, while in, intruding on their their workspace. Oh, I'd also like to spot a bunch of feds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the, uh, the point I'd make is that um, when, you, when you're testing someone's security, there's no way they don't see you as the adversary. So um, tough. I work for a different branch of government, you know. Uh, Smile. <laughs> Bend over. Uh, <laughs> uh, microphone. Methodology is pretty straightforward. You know, you uh, imitate the outside and you imitate the inside. And, uh, you know, crunchy on the outside, soft in the middle. I mean, uh, how complicated do you want to get? Um, people think InMap is, you know, just a tool for mapping a network. It's really nice for collecting information, you know. And then it gives you the pointers to where you need to go. People go wireless, screw them. You know, people don't go wireless, screw them. People use Microsoft, screw them. People use Linux, screw them. People use Apple, screw them. You know, they're not, they're not prepared. I'm seeing a trend here. Well, there's, you know. Um, I thought I was there. Well, it's 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 just listen. You you go in you go in and you give them the snapshot of the technical representation at a point in time. That's the symptom of the disease. And you explain to them that the real problem is that there hasn't been an eligible receiver on the civil side. There hasn't been an eligible receiver for the private sector. Um, you're trying to convey to them, okay, this is what could have been done, and by the way, here's all the stuff you need to do to fix them. In some cases, we made 500 recommendations on one job. Um, they're very specific. They're very technical. They're very detailed. The front of the report that we give to them, which is what all of you can read, because that's what we post to the web, you'll see it has a recurrent theme. Is somebody responsible for security? Do you do risk management? Um, please, sweet Jesus, don't use passwords. Um, you know, come up with something better than that. I mean, these are the kinds of recommendations. It isn't rocket science. You know, it's just a bunch of buggy software that people haven't configured properly. Let me, let me pile on on the uh, methodology end. Uh, my group at NSA includes the uh, red and blue teams, so that are similar penetration testing kind of work. Uh, we've actually bundled up this may I may or may not help you, but bundled up the uh, blue team methodology into uh, a thing that's now being trained like it was trained at Black Hat. The uh, InfoSec assessment methodology and evaluation methodology are de were developed at NSA. That's the way we conduct our jobs. And then we've uh, kind of worked that to, uh, to outsource or to license it out to a commercial company to train for whoever wants to do it. We don't get anything from it. 
we just it's just a way of pushing out the uh, the methods that we use for anybody else who wants to do similar kind of work and then we do you know the same kind of technical work we also our blue team spends a lot of time you know it's more than giving folks recommendations right it's helping them walk through uh, um, analysis of their configurations of all the components and how do I put things in place you know it's not it's not simple fixes it's training people and doing a lot of things to, if you're going to uh, solve these problems um, you know after penetration testing thanks Um, I have a two-part question for the NASA representative. Um, first, I mean, I know you guys aren't a consistent target for a lot of attacks. Uh, recently, you were a few years ago. Um, and my second, so do you take kind of a holistic approach to a lot of that? Uh, and my second uh, part to the question is, uh, sir, are you drunk right now? <laughs> Shame on Frere. In response to your first question, I, I'm actually honestly just a cop. Um, one, one of the things <laughs> NASA <laughs> NASA NASA's IT security infrastructure is it's really fluid, and what a lot of people don't really recognize with NASA is that it's actually it's a research organization, and a lot of their systems are by by definition, open. They're a research organization. They have to share data. When you st start sharing data, you're leaving yourself open to attack. So yes, we, we get attacked an awful lot because we're a high visibility target. And for some reason, people see hacking NASA as something that's uh, like the golden orb or something. I, you know, I don't quite get that. But you have to understand, we're not like DOD, where everything's locked down you know, and you've got all these policies in place. We get a lot of PhDs that security is pretty low on their list of things they've got to do. So that's something that we deal with. Um, I don't really do IT security. I do the aftermath of bad IT security. So um, hopefully that answers. Uh, yeah, Pert will. <laughs> that, that's not mine. <laughs> Uh, having to deal with uh, a huge bureaucracy that often doesn't listen to common sense, what advice would you give to us as we go into the boardroom to try and convince the CEO that uh, his AOL account is in his best interest? And uh, where are the UFOs hidden? <laughs> oh, man, I love this audience. <laughs> right Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, I, I think the answer to your question kind of falls along the lines of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which I kind of politely refer to as the Accountants' Full Employment Act. Um, I, I take it you're accountants. <laughs> um, the other point to be made is any time a person is on a board or any time a person is a CEO, they are tagged with some very s severe responsibilities, which they use to justify their enormous salaries. Um, but part of that is called a fiduciary duty to the stockholders, a fiduciary duty to those who have invested their money and who have invested their lives in, into the, the, the company to try to make it profitable and try to make it better. And there's so often they're so concerned, and I think part of this is due to the accountants, it's also due to the stock market, the way that operates, and that is the fact that they're driven on short cycles for return on investment. They call that ROI, and that's very important as a business model. But as a lawyer, I want people to remember that ROI also stands for risk of indictment. So if they screw it up, <laughs> uh, they run into this issue of deprivation of liberty, also known as jail. I'd like to get your opinion on uh, how you think the legal system is keeping up with all of the new technology issues that's coming up. Because depending on who you talk to, um, we're either keeping up with them or we're way behind in terms of where the legal system is. And having worked in a law office for some time, I've experienced that we're really far behind. Um, and I just want to know, like, what, because you guys are out on the, to use the cliche, out on the front lines. and. Our mission on this panel is to bring the legal community into the 20th century. <laughs> you know, the 20th century would be great if we could just get them that far. 
I'll take a crack at that. Uh, there are components within the Department of Justice that are not only training uh, federal investigators, but are also training prosecutors. I've been involved in training prosecutors. I'm with Homeland Security at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and I, by the way, I should add, there were no tax dollars that were injured in my travel to Las Vegas. I'm here at my own personal expense, but we've been, we've been training prosecutors, and the final frontier, quite frankly, in the justice system is, is training the judiciary. And that is even being done by the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section in the Department of Justice. And there's an old saying in the legal profession, you know, how do, what do you call a person who has graduated last in their law school class? The answer is, your honor. <laughs> I, I can take shots at the judiciary. I used to be a judge. So, so. <laughs> but that's a very, very good question. It's, it's something that, quite frankly, we, we base our decisions in the justice system on what's called stare decisis, which means the precedent stands. And yet, we are trying to analogize into a realm that is totally different than what the legal systems had to deal with in the past. So there's going to be some truth found between the prosecuting community and the defense community. We have an adversarial system of justice. Some have an inquisitorial system. But uh, that's a very interesting question. I appreciate the fact that it was asked. Thanks. May I'd like to broaden the question a little bit. Is I don't think that there's a forum in the United States whether it's legal or political or ethical or philosophical, to address the issues that science and whole is teeing up for this country. Uh, and whether it's biotechnology or whether it's information technology or whether it's nanotech or, or cognitive sciences, there are a whole raft of issues out there that are going to be affecting our lives, liberties, and pursuit of happiness before we know it. And there's no way to even engage that in the political system. So as you go back to your representatives, you go back to your, uh, to the, presidential debates, whatever. You know a lot of things that most people in the American public don't know, and get those into the debate. Get those into the question, because without having it, we're going to be, you know, as you say, always behind the power curve. Let me kind of give a holistic observation on your question. Part of the problem is that the legislature, whether it's state or at the federal level, and I work at, at both, is the fact that they only are in a position to react to the immediacy of a problem, to just a very small part of it rather than a large part of it. Let me give you a couple of examples to help illustrate what I'm talking about. Many members in Congress are very sensitive to their constituent concerns. The constituent concerns in a cybersecurity arena tend to revolve around a couple of issues, uh, protection of personal privacy, uh, privacy issues, and identity theft. Those are hot button issues. And so members of Congress, and also at the state and local level, are going to focus on those issues. But they're going to be short-term solutions to just a part of the problem. And part of your responsibility, part of your responsibility and part of our responsibility as well, is to help educate those members in a legislative environment that it's not a small problem, it is a big problem, and it needs to be worked together, not just piecemeal. There are some attempts, and here's how it plays out in the business world. There was a big concern about the loss of personal data with uh, companies that aggregated your personal data. And when that was lost, that would result in identity theft. So California was a leading state that said, all right, any financial institution that abuses or loses personal information of someone who does business with that banking institution, that financial institution, has to report that loss to the affected individual, even if that individual does not live in California. Now that is quite a burden on the financial services community. They complained about it, but it won a tremendous amount of public acceptance to the point where I think there are 27 states that have their own version of that, which means companies who are doing, I mean, banks do business all over the, all over the United States. So they have to comply with 27 variations of a theme. So you need national level legislation on that point. And it's not just at the national level you have to think about. Our world is net connected. So the European privacy laws, the uh, European Privacy Directive has tremendous impact on our lives here in the United States. They're more interested in privacy than we are because they've experienced totalitarian governments much more recently than we have. So those are some big issues that, that need to be addressed. You can't do it piecemeal. It's got to be done in a big way. And you're in a position to help influence the outcome. Don't just complain about the system. Make a change in the system. The time is now.
The challenge is yours. Uh, two part question as well. Um, first, if the country came under cyber attack, would you reach out to the community represented here for help and what would that look like? And two, regardless of that first answer, what will the government response be should the community decide to take matters on their own, on, on, on their own hands? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer the second one. Uh, the first one, uh, it seems to me that uh, if we were under serious cyber attack, the nation would be uh, foolish not to take advantage of the skill sets that are here in this community. My guess is that initially we would not. We would look internally. And then depending on the level of the attack, we'd probably realize that we have to draw on the skill sets here. And so I think uh, we would very quickly get to the situation to talk about. Uh, I honestly can't say how we'd uh, address the second one, perhaps. You say if the country was under attack, I would say there are many days I feel like the Internet is under attack. And as far as reaching out to the community, we always reach out to the community. Uh, sources of information, we know there are people sitting in the private sector. The private sector owns the Internet, and they are most familiar with it. They're looking at the security of the information of the internet. They're looking at the net flow. They're doing the net flow analysis. They're they're configuring the security on the internet. We would be fools not to look to the community, so to speak, the, the very people who are securing the internet for help, because the private sector sees it first. And as far as taking the law into your own hands, well, we would handle you like any other criminal. That's what we do. But we would reach out to you for your assistance because we know that skill set is there. Even though I have it on my staff, there are a lot more of you than there are of us. So we don't have to be under attack for, we don't have to be under attack to reach out to you. We need your help. So we, I'm constantly looking for talent. And believe it or not, I do get a lot of I do get a lot of takers, but then again, I could always use more because, as you know, the internet it's growing and the maturity of the internet uh, continues. As so, those the skill set of the bad guys continues to get better. So I'm going to be looking for more help in the private sector, folks like yourself, to assist us. So, if that's a if that's a reasonable answer. That's how we handle things. So the, the industry, the private sector, might be different than the community industry, and the industry kind of Well, of when I, your community, I, I look at you and I don't say that you're necessarily different than the private sector. If you're not working for the government, then I look at the, the net community, so to speak, as the non-government community. I'm looking in various areas whether it's a security company, whether it's a, uh, a group doing nothing but uh, <coughs> compromising networks. I want to get to know those people. I need that skill set. I would just reiterate uh, th that point that I think most of us here in the panel have spent our lives in public service. We found it a worthwhile and rewarding profession. Uh, the people with the skill sets out there in this audience, uh, we would invite you to seriously look at joining that uh, because uh, you bring a lot to the table and we have needs for your, um, uh, for your talents. Uh, and as we said before, as long as you haven't crossed some sort of felony line, that uh, there's some real opportunities here. Along that same line, um, I'm a uh, network intelligence officer for the uh, city of New York. And uh, I guess my question goes to the impending uh, retirement of a lot of uh, members of the federal uh, team, so to speak. So my question is re uh, recruitment and, reti and uh, uh, I guess uh, I guess I would say recruitment uh, mostly, and then retention uh, secondly, which is probably more important. Uh, how can we possibly compete on the federal level with the private sector? I mean. 
trying to get someone in for 40k a year when they can go to the private sector for 120 how are we going to change that how can we because to get the best and brightest I mean you all are the best and brightest but you certainly probably not paid as well as you probably could be in the private sector how can we change that how can we either get our get our uh, our, our, our Count our, our congressmen and senators to, to realize this, that we can really, uh, you know, retain the quality uh, of people within our organizations. Let me, let me throw that back to you because you obviously took the challenge and accepted it. So I, I'd like to ask you because you probably have the answer to the question you're asking us, quite frankly. I, I appreciate your service. And give you one of those. Thank you very much for your service. I'd like to make a comment on that. You know, I think that most of the people that are in federal law enforcement, I've been there for 18 and a half years, if we look at somebody and all they're worried about is the money, they're probably not very well suited to federal law enforcement to start with. I think most of us that do this, do this because we're trying to serve our community, the American people, and in many cases, uh, even people of other areas. And I think that there has to be a, a certain desire to want to do the right thing at, at, at a certain ri you know, risk of not making a, as much money. I think that in the federal government, we're not in a very good position of bringing people in at a high salary. We're at a good position of bringing somebody in a low salary and letting them work up to a relatively high salary. But, you know, we have soldiers overseas that have, you know, Ph.D. degrees that are extremely intelligent that earn a fraction of what they would in private sector. They do it because of their dedication and loyalty. And I think that if somebody wants to be in law enforcement and they're willing to make those sacrifices, it's a damn good job. And I've been doing it for 18 and a half years. And, uh, you know, if I was young enough, I'd do it for another 18 and a half years. It's a fun job. It's a challenging job. And there's things that we can do or, and get challenged with that you will never, ever be exposed to in the private sector. So if, if you're worried about the dollars, don't apply for a federal job. But if you want some really good work, and, and when you're retired and have your grandchildren on your knee, <clears throat> and you want to tell them all the stories that you did, the war stories, then that's why you get into law enforcement. Uh, this gentleman touched on my question about three questions ago. Uh, with more programs coming to light with the NSA, with IRS, and even the FBI, your massive data aggregations, uh, how high on the grand scheme of priorities does security of information fall? And what are you doing, uh, or not in detail, of course, but <laughs> what are you doing to at least convince we the people that we can trust our government with that kind of personal information? Let me take kind of a philosophical stab at, at an answer to your question. I doubt if any of you, or maybe just a handful of you in this room, are going to remember an incident, uh, a program called Clipper Chip, which, well, that, that's refreshing uh, that you do remember this, because so many times we get to relearn history, uh, we forget to learn from past mistakes, and in that particular situation, the issue uh, focused on who was going to be the escrow agent. Was it going to be a federal entity or was it going to be a commercial entity? It turned out that no one was happy with any result. What I found very fascinating during that, during the national debate that, that, that arose as a result of Clipper Chip was that in spite of the fact of constitutional amendments that protected the privacy of U.S. citizens against encroachment of the government, the public at large seemed to be more willing to let their privacy be protected by private companies where you had little, if any, legal recourse when the information was lost. And very little concern about the fact that those companies might go bankrupt, as many of them did, and their data was lost. And it was, I, I found it just philosophically fascinating that people trusted private industry more than the government to protect their personal information. I'm not sure that answers your question completely, but it kind of gives you a thought piece to work with. Another thing uh, many people unfortunately are not aware of is the Fourth Amendment does not protect you against industry. It only protects you against government intrusions. 
the unreasonable intrusions. So that's something to keep in mind. And one of the things I do at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center is I teach cops how to obey the law while they enforce it. It's very important because federal law enforcement agents have a very long reach, and they can reach into people's privacy very, very easily in many, many ways. But I remind my students, I also tell them that if you don't like the Fourth Amendment, then I can tell you where you can get a job where you do never have to worry about these so-called technicalities about following the Fourth Amendment. You can go to work right now in North Korea, Cuba. They call them police states. So it's very, very important to remember that uh, the Fourth Amendment is the bulwark, and, and we train the agents that way, and sometimes they make mistakes, but when they do, we've had agents who have paid the same price that other people who violate individual civil rights pay. It's also worth, along the same vein, uh, European privacy laws were alluded to earlier. I think, by and large, in Europe, there's a much greater suspicion of industry than there is of government. And that's reflected in the, in the laws. And so there's a balance here. I think it's important to realize that our privacy can be affected by a number of things, not just the government. And the aggregation of data doesn't just exist in government databases. And the real solution needs to be a holistic one to the problem, not just uh, one piece. Thanks. Uh, my question is a serious one. Uh, I'd like to know what you gentlemen think about whether or not the federal government is prepared today to deal with a major cyber attack against our infrastructure. And if we're not prepared, what work still needs to be done to get us prepared? I, I want to just start with the fact that and it's not just the federal government uh, that protects this infrastructure. The vast majority of the infrastructure in the United States is in the private sector. And one of the things that came out of uh, going back to the uh, 90s with the President's Decision Directive 63 with these information sharing and analysis centers to try to bridge the gap between the public and private sectors. For a number of reasons, those haven't worked. But this has got to be some kind of a partnership between the federal government and the private sector. But I would argue emphatically that the nation as a whole, federal, private, state, local, is not in fact ready for that kind of an attack. Uh, I, I'll echo every point he made, and I'm going to give you a couple of graphic examples. Many years ago, the threat was kinetic, heat blast and fragmentation. You could see missiles coming over the horizon, and you crawled under your desk and protected yourself. Uh, and you knew, <laughs> yeah, duck and cover. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, which in my mind was not that long ago, <laughs> so some people think was well, still the case. Um, was that at Gettysburg? <laughs> <laughs> the cold winter of Valley Forge, wasn't it? No, it was Antietam. Yeah, I, I think it was during the War of Northern Aggression, but. I, <laughs> But, but, but the point to be made was we knew that if someone fired a ballistic missile at us, it was nation-state sponsored. It was an element of war. And people could agree on that. Today, the world has evolved in a very dramatic way as a result of political changes, economic changes, religious tensions, technology, information, economics. We're all tied together. And now, if a missile were to come into this country, we wouldn't know for a certainty, in all probability, whether it came from a rogue nation, whether it was actually nation-state sponsored, or whether it was a group of fanatics, or whether it was a, a crazy group somewhere and you pick a country. And the same thing is true of information warfare, and it's even scarier when you think about information warfare. Because as was illustrated in the Estonia situation, it doesn't have to be nation-state. It can just be a group of people who want to bring down an economic system as whoever did it, clearly demonstrated in Estonia. And it was a situation where it wasn't so much the Estonian government that responded, it was the entities that were attacked that were, were responded. And when we think of our critical infrastructure, and you can pick any number you want, I've read anywhere from 85 to 95 percent, is owned by the private sector. The private sector, again, has a legal responsibility, a moral responsibility to protect their assets. And unless and until they are in a position of investing enough money and investing your talent into protecting those assets, I think it's unfair to blame anyone unless you're willing to take care of your own house first.
it's interesting you asked that question because the number one number one priority within the cyber division of the f b i would be computer intrusions but the intrusions where most of my resources are dedicated are those intrusions with a counterterrorism nexus or those intrusions with a counterintelligence nexus and although i look at the intrusions to the banking system and the other cyber fraud that goes on when it comes to our national security that's where i direct a great deal of my resources so when i look at a major cyber attack i'm certainly not looking at it from i don't expect this attack to emanate from within and so i have a concern as that same concern you have whether the united states government is prepared to address a cyber attack but based on what i've seen in terms of the private sector stepping up to assist the government and whether their reason for stepping up is profit motivated or not i am still seeing the private sector step up to assist even in those instances where national security is involved because it is a what should i say a flat a flat world now in terms of connectivity and most of the countries in the us have subsidiaries in other countries and they want to see us succeed because they want to continue to do business so i don't think we have to worry about a quote cyber attack taking place right now one that we can't deal with because of the economic ramifications associated with that it won't just affect the united states it will affect many other countries but are we prepared to deal with one it depends on w w what part of the us infrastructure that attack actually hit unfortunately we're out of time uh, i have two two quick announcements on uh, First is Hacker Jeopardy tonight at 10 o'clock. Uh, Special Agent Tim Fowler, NCIS, is leading our uh, Fed Up team. And so come out and support your federal government. And uh, tomorrow, several of the Feds have agreed to uh, uh, sit in a dunk tank for the uh, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So. I want to thank the audience for the well thought out and considered questions. And uh, sorry we don't have enough time to answer, but we're going to be around most of the weekend. Thanks, guys. One more quick. Um, on behalf, since I'm the rookie here, I was asked uh, to thank all of you for allowing us into your house this weekend. We've had a great time. And as a coordinator, Jim Christie here has coordinated all our efforts, so we wanted to give him a gift. He also has a significant other here this weekend. So, Jim. Candy pasties. Thank you very much.